Well, welcome to Family Church. We are so glad that you're here. I know some of you are thinking, where are those two? <laughs> Where's here? <laughs> yeah, where is here? We are actually at one of our Family Church campuses. This is a joy for us. This is home for me, uh, a little bit less home for you. But I'm a we, guest speaker here, yeah. We are here at the Green Campus. I know some of you are saying, oh... What a delight that is. And we're in the middle of a sermon series called Living. We are looking at the second half of the book of Ephesians where we are really challenged with how do we live out what God is calling us to. Uh, I hope that you also are enjoying and engaged in some of the things that we're trying to do because we're asking ourselves the question, uh, what can we do now that we are only online and not before a live audience? And this is one of the things we can do is be here in green. So if you have your Bibles or your version uh, open, let's read the first couple of verses of uh, Ephesians 5, chap- chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. So he says, follow God's example. And I think in some of the versions it says, be imitators of God. And you think, that's a high standard. <laughs> <laughs> that is so intense and so big. And you think, how do I do that? And, and I think he's right in the middle of a passage telling us, this is what it looks like when you're doing that. And so he says, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So he takes Jesus giving of his life, not only in, on the cross, but his life coming to live on our planet and to do that in submission to God. He says, that's how we are to live. And so he talks about this idea that we are to walk in love, that the characteristic of somebody who is a follower of Jesus is that they are going to love like Jesus loves. And that's a high standard. Well, you see it as a path too. Yeah. Like there are steps that, that you follow along and that love is the example of that. So when I'm about to take a step, is that step loving or not? It was a, I mean, it's a great way you can actually couch it. Am, am I imitating? Well, am I expressing love in that fashion? And it's like, it's not just a bunch of rules and regulations. You do all these things. And, and somebody mentioned that we're in a period of a lot of rules and regulations. But that doesn't necessarily describe love. And then there's another descriptor down in verse 8 where he talks about we are to walk like children of light. And that this is the same thing. These are not different things. That we are walking now not only loving like Jesus loved, but we are walking in light of mm-hmm. and, and there's a light on a path. In fact, I think that one of the best pictures of it is that this is a path. Um, that we are following Jesus, and it is not you get things right when you're 25 and then you do that the rest of your life. It's a constant challenge and it's a constant process of change to continue to follow day by day, moment by moment, the light of the Holy Spirit and the love that Christ has given to us. And, and so that, that idea of a path, I think is, it's really, it's a great picture when we think of our life as a path. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, it's a very individual path. And it reminds me uh, of one of the favorite stories, Will, of your and my relationship. And, and uh, many years ago, uh, Will had this great idea. Why Write that down. It was a great <laughs> idea. At least going in, it was a great idea. In my mind, I think a crazy idea. And that is we're going to go on a survival camp out. So what, what's a survival camp out mean? You take hardly anything. Basically what they would have on the show Survivor. So we had flint and steel. Three fishing hooks, a little bit of line, some twine, a machete. And a can. And a can. cook things in if we ever it, found anything to cook. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't just berries. <laughs> and like one fish. Oh, wait. We found that other thing you ate. I was already in trouble by this point. But remember what you ate? Oh, turtle is excellent, just by the way, in case you're looking for a way to survive. Boiled turtle. <laughs> yeah. So we get up there and... Not to mention any names, but one of us got sick. And, of course, we're debating about... I'm a wimp, okay? Is, <laughs> is he sick enough? Is he going to be okay? Sick enough? How sick did you need me? <laughs> well, we were up in the mountains. We'd gone up to Twin Lakes, so we'd hiked in a couple of miles, and we had gone up this rocky, narrow path to the second lake, and we were back in the woods from that. And so survival means you don't have flashlights. It means you have no way of seeing once it gets dark. And, and we're debating as it's getting darker and darker and darker. How and sick finally, am I? <laughs> finally, when it was about, what, 10 o'clock, and it was really dark, uh, we decided maybe it's it, time. it was time to get going. Will had thrown up several times, and uh, we thought, well, this could be something more serious. 
So my nephew, who was also with us in this crazy adventure, he said, oh, no problem. We can hike out in the dark. And I'm thinking, this is the part where a bad movie goes bad. This is where they have this great idea. The horror, the horror movie begins at this point in the yeah. story, yeah. Right. We have no flashlights. We have no way of seeing. It is not like a moonlit night or anything. It is black, black. And, uh, and I'm still throwing up. And you're throwing up. And Jonathan said, no, we can do this. I know how. We, we've practiced. <laughs> I was thinking later, who practices walking through trails in the dark? But, but he said, no, here's what you do is you, you get a stick of some kind. And so we're kind of pantomiming it for you here. So, Keeping better social distance. But I would put my hand on his shoulder and then Jonathan was behind me. And so we at least would die together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's this tapping of the path. And, and we were on established paths. And, and it was true that when you lost the rest of your senses, you could, you could tap and you could hear. It was hard, packed earth. And, and as soon as you got over, <laughs> over like that, as soon as you hit off an edge or if you hit a rock or if you just sounded like vegetation, then, then you could steer. And some of these paths were zigzags back and forth. And so you had to come to the end when it went, whoa. And so we, we tapped our way along. And let me tell you, at the beginning, we were very slow. Mm-hmm. And in fact, when we got down by the second lake, if you remember, there were lots of paths. And so we had to not only find the a path, we had to find the path. That's true, yes. And, and it, so we were tapping our way along. And, and the amazing thing is that by the time we got more experienced, by the time we were ready to follow the path, mm-hmm. um, we had able, been, been able actually, uh, and it was a little bit flatter and, and uh, a little wider, but you could actually walk almost as quickly as you did in the daylight. You know, as you're saying it, the, if you follow the analogy out, we had learned to walk in love. We had practice now. Uh, we had practice on the difficult cliff area, and now we were in a little bit smoother sailing, if you will. Um, but there we were, and we knew, even by feel, how the angle of the path went. And it was so fascinating watching ourselves able to move. We even would comment, man, look at how quickly we're moving now in comparison. And I think this, that the analogy fits so nicely into Ephesians 5, both in walking the path of love. And then what if, was that, that path of light? Well, and I think, I think it's really a powerful insight to say, when he starts mentioning some of the sins that we are to avoid, instead of simply seeing them as a list, I think when, when you're walking on the path and you get out to the edge, it sounds different. Mm-hmm. And, it, and uh, you know, I think that there's, there's the path of light, and most of us are not in danger of jumping off the cliff of darkness. Mm-hmm. I think we're really in danger of getting into the path of dim. That's great. Where we, we move away from the real center of what God's wanting. And, and so if we look at this passage... Yeah, verse he, 3, he, he starts us, on. He gives us some guides. Here's right. the edge of the path. Don't mm-hmm. go there. Yeah, it's three of them. The, the sexual immorality. He talks about greed. And he just talks about foolish talk. Um, not just foolish talk as in babbling, but when you are going to say things that are inappropriate, when it's coarse joking... Um, just really pushing the edge. And I love what you're saying about this, that walking the path of love and walking in a path of light. And are you aware when you're getting off? Because one of the, my realizations as we're doing this is we're looking at um, these three sins and there's foolish talk and there's greed and then there's sexual immorality. My observation of this, sexual immorality is really a lot more like the cliff. Mm-hmm. The consequences are so significantly uh, more devastating it's so critical to know that this is exactly what the danger is. And so as you're moving along and you feel the path, the path of love, path of love, and then think about even just foolish talk. So when you say something foolish, because you're, and you're, let's just say you're putting someone down. Now, is that the path of love? Now, it's not the same cliff as sexual morality, but oh, see the danger here? That's not the path. And I just love this image of these three, these three danger sins. Like if your heart's moving towards them, you're in a place where you are walking off the path of love. So, so the question obviously is, starts with how do you get on the path of light? How does that happen? Mm-hmm. And how do you continue to follow? And so uh, to, to answer that question and also to honor mothers on Mother's Day, we're going to share a little story with you about how God got a hold of somebody very significant in my life and how that path has made an impact on my life. Let's watch this. Well, I am pleased to introduce to some of you my mom. 
and uh, she has been a teacher of mine. People go to your Bible study and they say, you know, your mom's a good Bible teacher. It's like, <laughs> you think? Uh, she's been teaching me my whole life and a source of inspiration. And I wanted her to share with you how it was that she began this path of light and love that Ephesians talks about and when God became a real part of her life. So why don't you share with us how that happened? Well, when I was 16, um, I was, I, we had moved from my home to a big city and a big high school in the middle of November. Mm. So I had to, I, I was really very <laughs> disoriented, I guess you'd say. And uh, because of that, I made most of my friends at church and I began to get more and more involved mm -hmm. in church, which it was a good thing. And uh, my family was background was churched and we were... We believed the Lord. So you'd say at that point you believed in the Bible and yeah. believed in God and believed, believed in the whole, all the truth. I believed it, yeah. Okay. But we were in a in a youth meeting. <clears throat> Our team from Moody Bible Institute came, and they were they were using the first flannel graph I had ever seen. So this is new technology at the time. Some of you still don't know what that is, but they <laughs> put little pieces of flannel that. up on a board and, and it was... And they stick. And they stick. <laughs> <laughs> and they were telling this story of in, in Exodus about the Passover where God said uh, to the people of Israel who were slaves in Egypt, and this was the 10th plague, and God said, kill a lamb, with the blood on the doorposts and the top of your doors. And then when I come through, I'll see the blood and I'll pass over you. Yeah, the death angel. It was yes, going to be Yes, the death a, angel a scary would thing. not take the oldest son. And so they they put, the, this team from Moody put a picture of a door up on the flannel graph. Mm -hmm. And to be real honest, I knew the story well, and I was more interested in why it stuck than I was <laughs> in what they were saying. But then they began to make uh, the illustrations of what the people might have done instead of what God said. Oh. And they could have put a lamb outside the door and just tied it to the door, but that isn't what he said. He said to kill the lamb. And uh, then they said... So, so putting it outside the door would have been like what? Well, it would have been like people who believe in Jesus as a good man. Okay. But not as in God the Savior. <clears throat> Then they said maybe they somebody would have killed the lamb and put the blood in a bowl outside the door. Huh. And they said that would be like the people who believe in their heads but not in their hearts. They've never applied the blood to the door. They've never applied the truth to their hearts. And I was still just sitting there with everything kind of just yeah, yeah, yeah. I already know that, yeah. And then God spoke to me, and he said, you know, God isn't long-winded. <laughs> he said three words. He said, Peggy, that's you. Mm. And mm. I don't know how I knew it was God, and I, but I knew exactly what he meant, and what he meant was that in spite of the fact that I had been in church every, <laughs> every Sunday of my life almost, I was not a Christian. Mm. And that was a real shock. And then I thought, well, I didn't know I had a choice. Up to then, it had all been kind of environmental, and I'd just gone along with it. And now I had a choice, and I'm going to look this thing over before I get into it. So you didn't respond that, that time? I didn't respond mm. well at all. <laughs> And I began, I was in such a turmoil for the next few months, and I don't think anybody ever knew it but me. So there's battle going on inside of you, and absolutely everything and, on the outside still yeah. looks the same. And I began to look at the Christians, and it didn't... Didn't look good. It, huh? it, it, was, it didn't take long to find some flaws. Yeah. <laughs> and then, as I say, I, I didn't think God had done such a hot job either. Mm. And um, I remind people I was 16. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was going through all that. And then that summer I got to go through the, to a Christian camp. And uh, there was still a turmoil going on. I had a roommate, a college girl, that 
kind of sneered at fundamentalism. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> so I was, I, I, I was still going through this battle. But at the last night, they asked if you would come up and if you wanted to respond to Jesus to take a, a log or a piece of wood and put it on the fire. And you could say something if you wanted to. And I was sitting there and God was just so drawing me and I knew I needed to go. <clears throat> but I'd felt so dumb. If I went up there, all the kids that I went with, they all thought I was a Christian. Hmm. And I just battled in my heart, but I finally walked up and took a piece of wood and put it on the fire. <laughs> I don't know if I said anything or not, but when I did that, Jesus became so real to me that I just almost, when I prayed, I almost felt like I could touch him. And he has never left. Huh. He's been with me ever since, and he's changed me and led me and provided for me and all the way. All the way up to 95. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And he still promises to be here to the end. <laughs> to the end. There you go. <laughs> he makes a point of old age, he says. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your story with us. We love that very much. Thank you for your life and your example. As you, as you have followed the light, other people have followed you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, you can see why that has made such an impact on my life. I'm, I'm so proud to acknowledge uh, my mom's love of Christ and her walking in light. And, and you know, one of the things that is always penetrated is, is how humble she is. When she talks about how God got a hold of her, she still gets a break in her, in her voice. And when she talks about parenting, she had five kids in six and a half years. Um, when, when she talks about the hard parts of her life, she always comes back to, and this is what God said to me, and this is what God did to show me, not what terrible kids I had or how hard it was, but what I needed to learn. And, and her walk of faith, her walk in this path of light has taught me not only the lessons that she shares, but in watching her path, she's, she's a continual inspiration to me. And, and I think it's a great picture of what does it mean to live in light? It's a long obedience in the same direction. 95 years old, and today 95. she is impacting people, pointing them towards that path. Isn't that a, a beautiful, yeah. beautiful example? Well, I want to read to you um, just the, the, this path that we're talking about. So here it is. This is verse 8, and we're beginning to look at this from the light and the dark perspective. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Uh, I love the fact that the scripture uses these metaphors, these pictures that are that work in any culture, and, and light and darkness is such a powerful image. And, and actually, darkness isn't a thing. It's only light is a thing because darkness is simply the absence of light. And, and so I want to, to share with you a, an insight that I saw as, as I was reading through this, literally for this message. Mm -hmm. He talks about live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. And then he mentions have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. And, you know, I think we have a temptation to not want to walk in evil, but we want to know about it. And mm -hmm. he just said, you know, exploring all of the latest sin <laughs> trends is not a place I want you to go because we get subtly sucked into it. Mm -hmm. And then he says, everything exposed by the light becomes visible. So sin grows best in the dark. If it's brought mm -hmm. out, that, that's a good thing. And then there's this phrase, he says, Everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And I had never seen that phrase before. In fact, I didn't even know what I was reading. It was like, what? So I checked out a couple other versions, and it, and it talks various ways in which, yeah, that is the, the literal text, is that the things that the light shine on become a light. And I thought, what a, what a great picture that is. I, I have a little bit of a, a putty here that is fluorescent. And I'm showing it to you, but you can't see it because it is just dark. And it is yet something that will receive light. So when I take it and I put it under a concentrated light, when I show the light to this lump of putty, and then I'm going to take it and I will show it to you, 
And then you realize that it has become light. Exactly what the text says. Yeah, and I think what a great picture, because I don't have light in myself. I mm -hmm. have light in my relationship with Jesus. And Jesus said he was the light of the world, and then he eventually said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. Uh, what I love of the imagery of this is like, as he's saying walk in the path of light, he doesn't say, hey, get filled up on Sundays. Hey, make sure you get a little here. Walk in it. Come back in, in it. it. Come back in it. Because you, it starts dimming yeah. as soon as it gets away. Yeah, the moment you pull out, pull yeah. away, it's gone. But when you continue to come back over and over, what a great uh, picture that is. It allows us to see that. Um, and as he comes out of that, he gives some great clarity. It's almost as though he says, walk in the path of uh, love and walk in the path of light. And then he says, here's some components that are really going to help you move. And I kind of picture this as when we were farther down the path and it was, the movement was, as, as you buy into these, this is where you're going to really capture that. So, you, you get better at finding the path and staying in the path. That's great. Even when you're 95. <laughs> Even 95. So uh, here we are at uh, verse 15. Here's what it says. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. So in this path of light and love, he says, you're going to be focused on being wise, not unwise. And he gives us a couple of these contrasts back and forth. And the word wise is such a powerful scriptural word all the way, Old Testament, New Testament. And it really means the application of knowledge to your life. So there are a lot of people, and even in my mom's story, she said, I knew about Jesus, I knew about the Bible, I believe those things, at least in my head. So I think there's a lot of people that believe that we ought to be more loving, that we ought to walk in the light, those are good things. Mm -hmm. But this idea of wisdom means that I have, as a lifestyle, following this path, I actually begin to choose the things that are wiser, the things that are fitting with who God is and what he wants to do in our lives. So that's one of the markers. Wait, wait, you, let me go with you. You have a little bit more there that I think is so fascinating. I didn't catch this before, but in 10, so this is a little bit earlier when it's talking about the path of light. I think this is part of the mark of what you're saying. He says, find out what pleases the Lord, mm. which is so much that echo of whether or not you're being wise is, am I walking on that path? And there's a, there's a learning curve there that what you know, I think you said it, you get to 25 and you know it all. No, no, no. Who you are at 25 is not who you'll be at 35 because there's this part, this part of this thing that where you're finding out what pleases the Lord and that's that growing in wisdom. And, and there's such a tendency to want to please other people, to want to please our spouse. And he says, this is how you find wisdom. It's what, that's great. what pleases the Lord. And then the second one is... Uh, he goes right down from there in verse 16. He says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And I was thinking about this, make the most... And I'll tell you where it's easiest for me to make the most. If we're at Disneyland, because at Disneyland, you know that this is an amazing moment. You don't get to come very often. You better get all of it out of it. You've paid a lot of money. You've traveled a long way. Let's make the most of it. We got to make sure we get fast passes and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And you make a plan. <laughs> and what I noticed in this is this make the most of every opportunity. And I was thinking to myself, the first question of whether or not you're making the most is realizing that there's an opportunity because nothing really feels like much of an opportunity right now because I am not enjoying this COVID quarantine anymore. It was wonderfully novel for the first few days. Um, this does not feel like an opportunity anymore. And how do I have a perspective that changes in that? And the first thing I think you need to see on if you're going to make something, make it an opportunity and make the most of it, we're going to have to be aware that there's an opportunity. So put yourself in the worst situation. Someone's upset with you. What is the opportunity right now? In fact, I, I would say, I, I'm going to process this with you. I might not be right on this. So you, you correct me if I'm wrong on this. But I was thinking about this, making the most of every opportunity. I was thinking about that old phrase that you can't have a miracle unless you have a problem. Mm. And so I was thinking about, I, just put yourself in a, in a place where there's massive conflict or things are really bad. Isn't that a place where love is most evident that when someone is angry at you and you can respond with, kind, with a kind tone and with a gentleness, isn't that walking in love? Isn't that making the most of the opportunity that on that path? It's funny, even that phrase we often think of, here's a great chance to make a bunch of money or here's a great chance to move ahead. We, we think of it as here's success already visible. But the reality is that it may not look like an opportunity at all. That's, that's a good point. Okay, well, and I, I think there's a, something that I'm just processing, and I'm just going to speak to the, the idea of where we are with coronavirus and the COVID-19 and just the pandemic that we're in and just where I am in this. So this is me processing. 
I feel like one of the things that's so necessary for me in this to make the most of every opportunity is to really center into a place of peace. Um, peace is not something that I'm finding naturally coming to me at this, at this phase of my life. And, and so as I see that, I looked at the next verse, and in verse 16, this is what it says, after it says, make the most of every opportunity, in verse 17, it says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Mm-hmm. And I think when I'm thinking of that path of love and light, and I'm focused on that, he, you don't have a path to just randomly go somewhere. The path has a direction. The direct, there's, a, there's a purpose in this path that's taking me somewhere. And when I feel this randomness of like, what are we supposed to do? And then I remember, find out what the Lord's will is, and take a step. How can I be loving today? How can I move forward in that? And then there's a realization. There is a path and there is stepping off of it. And it it reminds me, I don't know if you remember this part, but when we were walking down in our survivor trip, near the end, we were probably within a half mile of, of the car. It's after midnight by this point. But we kept walking straight and we got about 20 feet into another path that wasn't our path. We, they, our path was supposed to switch back. Mm-hmm. Our car was the other direction. God's will was the other direction. <laughs> and we walked on and there was a distinct thing where we stopped and said, something's wrong. And there were two things that we noticed. It smelled different. There was a different foliage. And the path was much softer because there was more Hadn't been growth. Yeah. I mean, the trees were still cut and it was some old logging road or something, but we got off the path. And I was just reminded of that, that um, make the most of every opportunity. We have to go with verse 16 and say, what is the Lord's will and where is he calling me? And I, and I hadn't, this is one of those things that when we're sitting together, sometimes things come as we're sitting here together. The thing that I hadn't thought of when we were preparing for this is how much I needed to hear today. This idea that God has a plan and this path is important and that right now he has a plan and it may not feel like a plan. It may feel like randomness and it may feel like we're trapped. I know in the worship, we just sang free, free forever. We're free. And the other day we were joking about this, that we're trapped, trapped under quarantine. We're trapped, trapped till we find a vaccine. (laughs) Get me out of this. And then remembering, even if it doesn't feel like I'm moving, I am on God's path and his will. And that's really a realistic part of this picture. Um, I think people get stuck on our spiritual journey. We, we get stuck, we get sidelined, we find cul-de-sacs, and I think this next part is what really puts it all together. And you see how these are kind of, he does a comparison, be wise, not unwise, make the most of every opportunity, not squandering your life. And then he comes down and he says, and don't be drunk with wine, which is verse 18, which leads to debauchery. Time out. <laughs> You're going to have to explain it. That, that, that's not a, a vocab word we got a lot around here. What, what is debauchery? Well, I looked it up in a different version, and it says dissipation. Does that help you a lot, too? <laughs> no. So now you have to define two things. What do you mean? What is debauchery? And, and the key idea there is that we have a great tendency to want to be under the influence of something. And mm. he says, if you're drinking wine... You are under the influence, and that leads you, and the simple idea is it leads you to excess, Mm -hmm. to doing things, trying to find this, remember we talked about that, following the butterfly of happiness till you hit the cliff of addiction, and and just that idea, I want to, to be more happy than I should be, and that leads me to doing things that I never would do if I weren't drunk. And how many stories are this way? Oh, well, I got drunk and then we have a kid. And, or I hear nowadays <laughs> that it, there's, um, I got drunk and look what I bought on Amazon. And, like there's memes all over the place on that. Actually, it, I was in geography when, um, class when I was in college and there's a, um, we had a British teacher and he told us a story that whenever the economy crashed, uh, and I'm not going to say the country, but in, there's an, uh, a country wherever their economy crashed, the government would subsidize the vodka. Maybe that just gave it away which country. They would subsidize the vodka, lower the price of vodka to get everyone drunk so that they wouldn't revolt. Because the idea of the influence just drops their ability to, to create a revolt. To do anything right. logical. So what's the opposite? So he says, don't walk in, in that drunkenness. What does he call us to? And I think sometimes we hear this phrase and it, we think of it's like super spiritual something, but he says, be being filled with the Spirit. So all of these statements are active that we are to be making the most of every opportunity, to be being filled. And I think he teams it with the contrast of being under you know, wine or alcohol or drugs or pot or whatever, that you're under the influence and that to stay under the influence is a constant process of drinking. Like coming back to the light? 
Yeah, and so he's saying the opposite here. In the same way, it, we're just like empty cups, and we need to come and continually be asking the Spirit of God to fill us. And part of it is what we talked about last week of repenting and, mm-hmm. and cleaning out and, and recognizing the sin and letting the Spirit come and, and clean us up and fill us. But, but that the life that we're talking about, where you're walking consistently in love, where you're walking consistently in light, we can't do that. That's way beyond us. That this is about saying, God, it has to be your Spirit filling me so full that I overflow, mm-hmm. that the Spirit shows instead of just me. That's great. And I think that's a powerful contrast. Don't be under the influence of these, and, and this is a good word for the this whole isolation. You know, some people are binging on watching Netflix, and some people are binging on the vodka and or whatever. And And I think he's saying... Don't go that way. That's not the path. This idea and how to stay on the path is this constantly process of saying, Spirit, I need you to fill me. I'm surrendered to you. I need your wisdom and your guidance and your direction. And when I do that, then I can follow the zigzags of life and I can Mm -hmm. see the opportunities for what they are. And so it's this dynamic picture of us choosing to let God fill us so that we can stay on the path. So what's so interesting about the way you're saying this is a setup for next week. I don't know if you realize this, but he's really coming to the end of our focus today, which is verses 1 through 20. And he's talking about this overflow of the Spirit. Well, the beauty of this is next week, starting at verse 21, it's the focus on how we relate to each other. And what we're going to see is as the Holy Spirit is flowing out, this is what makes it possible to be the husband that we're called to be, to be the wife that you're called to be, or the children, or the employer. It changes relationships, but this is so critical, and if we don't catch this overflow um, part, we're really going to miss it. In fact, what I'd like to do is we have a challenge for you, but first, I always want to take this moment and pray over us specifically focused on this relationship with the Holy Spirit because it's going to affect how we're going to respond, how we're going to walk in light, and how we're going to walk in love. So let me just pray for us. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for just the gift that you are. I'm so grateful that um, as we are in these difficult times where we are in this, what feels like a perpetual transition time that you in your grace and in your love, you are calling us and that you are drawing us. God, I pray that you would fill each of us and as you fill each of us, that there would be an overflow that would affect and, and transform the way that we do relationship with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, um, with the people that we work with, just with every relationship we have. I got to pray that they would flow out of our connection with you. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Our hope is in you. Amen. Isn't that cool? Even just as we stop and pray, you feel that, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. letting go of some things. Letting the Spirit fill us, be directed. And, and it's kind of cool because he talks then about what else happens when you let the Spirit fill you. Mm-hmm. So speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, sing and making music from your heart to the Lord, and always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a practical way that you're going to relate. I love how he says both speak and sing. So for those of you who, who don't don't sing. You can enjoy <laughs> speaking truth to each other, speaking that um, hymn to each other, and then that heartbeat of gratitude. Um, have you noticed that your circumstances may not change at all, but when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you see them, your perspective changes when there's that overflow of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, gratitude is not a function of perfection. It's a function of being filled with the Spirit. Wow, write that down. Say that again. That's powerful. Gratitude is not a function of perfection because we don't experience that in this life. Mm -hmm. It's a function of being filled with the Spirit. Ah, so good. And and maybe that's exactly what some of you needed. You've been looking at perfection, and you're going to find some freedom in that very phrase that he just gave right there. We want you guys to have a discussion together uh, in your home. And if you're by yourself, we want you to connect with someone, maybe over text or give a phone call. But here's the question that we have for you. As we've given this challenge of make the most of every opportunity, how are you going to do that today? And who's going to start that discussion? Uh, Whoever went to the bathroom last. (laughs) So you get to ask the question. You don't have to answer it first. You get to ask the question. The advantage of the smaller bladder. All right. (laughs) Love you guys.